This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Ledger, now accepting pre-orders for the all-new Ledger Blue Developer Edition, a Bluetooth and NFC touchscreen hardware signing device. Learn more about the Ledger Blue at ledgerwallet.com and use the discount code EPICENTER to get 10% off your first order. And by Jax. Jax is a user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to jax.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. Welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Brian Fabian Crane. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we have a very special guest, uh, Martin Kopelman, uh, who is the founder of Fairlay and Gnosis, which are prediction markets on Bitcoin and Ethereum respectively. Martin is also very involved in the current episode, uh, the debacle that is the DAO. And so we'll get some updates from him as well. So before we start off on these interesting topics, let us have an introduction from Martin. Martin, your intro, please. Yeah, hello. Um, yes, thanks, thanks for, for having me. Um, yeah, as you said, I'm for, for a while uh, in, in, into the space. So my big two topics are, or big topics are prediction markets. Um, I'm also involved with basic income project and but um, yeah, prediction markets uh, are kind of the biggest topic. And just recently, uh, I mean, there's no way to overlook uh, the DAO currently. So uh, I, I would not say I'm heavily involved, but I mean, I'm, I'm just observing it, writing about it, and maybe trying to help uh, solve, solve the problem or solve the mess. So you made some long threads on, on some of the, uh, uh, on Reddit about sort of everything that's happened with the DAO. Now, can you give us a, a bit of an update from, you know, we know roughly about the original heist. I think people are vaguely aware of that. Maybe you can just briefly sort of rec recapitulate what happened there and what's been going on since then. Like, where are we today? Yeah, I think um, my, my main motivation to, to do those posts are um, that I think it's just extremely important for everyone to know exactly what's going on and especially if if we as a community want to do um, decisions like um, hard fork um, then it is in my opinion extremely important important that everyone is, is educated and, and just knows what exactly is going on what uh, what are the reasons um, it's, it's also um, I mean, it, it it's, would also be extremely unfair to those who currently hold DAO tokens and have to make the decision uh, whether or not to sell them or or maybe to buy some. Um, so the, I I really think transparency is is important. Uh, that being said, so so concrete answers. Um, yeah, what what happened? Um, yeah, the hack. <laughs> there there was a, a, a bug exploited. It's a so-called re-entry um, thing that you could um, do m basically multiple transactions or multiple uh, withdrawals or multiple splits within uh, one um, transaction. So maybe, maybe I, I, I try to, to uh, explain very simple. Let's imagine um, the DAO is an ATM and let's imagine there are two steps. So the first step is, um, uh, get out, get out hundred uh, euros, and the next step would be uh, reduce the balance uh, by hundred euros. So, so that um, th that would be the logic of of the ATM. Uh, first, pay out, then reduce um, the balance of of the user. Um, and that is, and the problem is that those are not uh, atomic steps. So, with atomic, I mean. It's not done in one step, it's, it's done in two steps. So first it's paid out and then the balance is reduced. And that's exactly what, what the hacker exploited. So he, um, he set up or he made a setup that it was paid out multiple times um, and then the balance was only reduced or, or set to zero basically. And um, so, so uh, back to this ATM, say your balance is, um, 100 euros and there's an option uh, cash out all um, and, and the step is cash out the amount you have, 100 euros and then set it to zero then 
um, he called this cash out function like 20 times. Um, and then after 20 times 100 euro were cashed out, then it was set to zero uh, 20 times. Um, that was kind of the hack. He even combined it with something that in the end, before it's set to zeros, he could even transfer those 100 euros to, to another account. So then um, this, this account uh, where, yeah, that was already zero, that was then sent to zero, and then he could do the same thing uh, from, from the second account. So that, that's, that's kind of what happened. I mean, it, it seems to me that like, whoever, the, whoever the hacker is, um, is like an extremely smart person. Uh, because like when the, when the attack came out, I, I clearly remember that there being a phase where I was kind of looking at, at all of the posts that were coming in about the attack. And I was like, these, none of these posts completely explain the whole attack. Because uh, they were, they were, as you said, like there's this one attack in which uh, you do the accounting only after after the withdrawals. So this was well known before the DAO hack, and everybody was expecting this to be used somehow. But then there was something something strange about this attack, as in he was able to execute this attack so many more times than he should have been able to. And you were the one of the first people to come out with a correct explanation of how he did it. And it seems like he exploited like two different things and combined them to make them very potent. And these two things were, and the second thing was also not very well known. So this seems like a very, very accomplished guy, it seems. Maybe a few comments on that. So, so first, the, the general attack was described uh, like like a few weeks before the hack. So, so um, the hacker just very carefully looked at, at the contract and found found the option to exploit this, this specific attack that no one else uh, found, found before. And indeed, um, so he came up with this, um, or they or she uh, came up with, with a thing that, um, uh, that, that they used this re-entry not only to do multiple withdrawals, but then in the last step to, to also uh, um, yeah, transfer money to, to, to so, so they, they had two attacking contracts and they send it. So in one transaction, they use the one 20 times and then send it to the other one to, to, to use it from the other one. So yeah, that, that was a smart uh, thing. Uh, but um, you, you claim that, that they were very smart. Um, yeah, yes and no. So, so they also did a big, big mistake in my opinion. Um, and they were basically too greedy. <laughs> so my, my opinion is, um, let's, so, so, I mean, we will maybe come to this later, but I think it's quite likely that we will see a hard fork now. Um, but let's, let's imagine the hacker would, uh, would have only, um, stolen like, let's say hundred thousand ether, or maybe, maybe 500,000 ether, or so, so let's say significantly less than they did. Um, I would, I would assume um, that in this case, uh, the, um, there wouldn't have been um, uh, a majority uh, for, for the hard fork. So, so I, I think uh, if, if the goal of the hacker would be to maximize their um, monetary profit, uh, it would be smarter to, uh, to have stolen less. Yeah, that, that might well be the case. So, so talking about hard fork, uh, there was a soft fork first, right? What happened there? I know there was a lot of criticism that somehow the soft fork wasn't proper and there were some bugs in that. Okay, so what happened there and how did the sort of consensus around the hard fork now emerge? Yeah, so, so the, the soft fork actually, I mean, in the end it didn't happen. So, so it was proposed, it was um, implemented and the idea was to basically, um, to basically block specific kind of transactions or censor specific kind of transactions, those who uh, would reduce um, uh, Ether from, uh, from a DAO contract. Uh, and it turns out that it's uh, quite complicated to, or maybe even impossible to, uh, to censor specific types of transaction, uh, transactions with Ethereum, um, because you cannot, uh, if, if you see a transaction, you cannot immediately see from the outside, from, from kind of the, the input data or from, 
from we call it the static analysis. You cannot see from the outside what this transaction will eventually do without executing it. So that means you have to execute it. You have to do maybe um, expensive computational steps uh, to eventually find out well this transaction is doing something uh, it's not allowed to do, and then you are you you uh, the transaction. Uh, wouldn't even have to pay for its gas because it should not be included. So that means it's not, it's maybe not possible, or it, it so that that opens the um, that opens the problem that an attacker can just create thousands or millions of those transactions and uh, spam the network at no cost. And so that that uh, that was the reason why um, the soft fork was not. Uh, eventually not not activated or eventually not executed is, is it the case that there's a there's a silver lining in in uh, in this soft fork episode so what you are essentially saying is in ethereum even in the future it would be very hard for for the developers or anybody uh, or the mining community or anybody to to create a soft fork that allows the allows the some of the transactions related to a particular address on Ethereum to be censored. Because if they were to implement this kind of feature anytime in the future for any other contract apart from the DAO, the same denial of service vulnerability would exist, right? This in a sense means it's very hard to censor addresses. Right. If you, if, if you want to keep Ethereum working, which is actually quite different from uh, what might happen with Bitcoin. In Bitcoin, it is in theory possible, but the community is hard against it. But in Ethereum, it just might not be possible at all. At least not with a with a soft fork. So if you would do a hard fork, where you would say um, um, those transactions they would just be invalid, but still would have to pay the gas. Um, and 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 again, that that is a hard fork because it would change the rule set. Um, then those things might be possible. But yeah, uh, with a soft fork or uh, and. I, 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 the, the important thing to know about a soft fork is um, miners, in, in principle, miners could do it uh, without asking anyone. So, so it, it, it doesn't need to be the developers who develop a new uh, version. In principle, miners can always do this kind of uh, censorship of transactions, collusion. Um, and, and I mean, it, to some degree, it happens in Bitcoin. So, so some miners would not include transactions that, that uh, used uh, what was it? Some gambling sites, or I, I don't remember. But 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 this happened at Bitcoin, and yes, it turns out it's harder for miners to do this in Ethereum. So talking about the the hard fork now, um, is it correct that essentially this will mean that you know the miners come to a consensus, and the money is essentially taken away from the hacker and given back to the original DAO holders and, and then they can withdraw it? Uh, yes, but I would uh, would say it's important to know that um, for especially for a hard fork, uh, it's more about the whole community. So yes, miners are obviously a part of the community, but also um, the core developers, uh, also people who write applications on, on top of um, uh, on, 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 on top of the protocol, uh, also obviously the exchanges, all those are important uh, in the decision um, to make a hard fork. So I mean, just just imagine um, everyone, the miners and so on, exchanges, they they would support the hard fork. But let's imagine all all people who build um, stuff on uh, Ethereum, so all DEP developers, they would come together and say, no, we don't support this hard fork. We will stick on the other chain and we will only write applications uh, for this other chain. So, so that, 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 would, um, that would still have a big influence. So, so hard fork is, is, is a bigger uh, consensus of the whole community. Well, uh, so yeah, so hard forks ex essentially need the consensus of the whole community. But you have also, in this, in this particular field, you have come up with a new set of data and observations that a significant portion of people who own Ether also own DAO tokens. And tell us like what data you found and how did you come to this conclusion and what it means for uh, the probability of the hard fork going through? 
Yeah, I mean, so in principle, those, those data are available um, on the blockchain. I mean, and the first very simple data point is that, what was it, 10 to 15 percent of all Ether uh, is in the DAO. So, I mean, that, that is already huge. And then you can just look at a few other numbers. So you can look at how, how many accounts exist on the Ethereum blockchain with more than one Ether. Um, and you can have a look at how many accounts um, uh, are, uh, or how many yeah, accounts do, uh, do held um, DAO tokens. And, um, and the third, or so, so um, uh, yeah, the third, uh, so, so the number of, of accounts that hold DAO tokens is a third of the number of accounts that have more than one Ether. So uh, it's, it's quite likely that, um, that the super majority or yeah, way, way more than 50% or all, all DAO token holders together Will are most likely holding way more than fifty percent of all ether. At least if you if you include people who, uh, uh, I mean, I, I guess most people just tried it out, or uh, most ether holders spend at least I don't know one ether or something like that just just to try it out. Let's take a short break so we can go to Paris. I stopped into La Maison du Bitcoin, the house of Bitcoin, at the Ledger offices, and I met with Ledger CEO, Eric Larchevec, so he could tell me all about the Ledger Wallet Chrome app. The Ledger Wallet Chrome app is a perfect companion app for your Ledger HW1 or Nano. We have a very powerful and cool feature. You can use multi-accounts, for instance, personal accounts, business accounts. This is very useful. Also, when you want to make a transaction, we use a second factor of verification. You can either use a physical security key or cryptographically securely pair your Android or iOS smartphone to your Nano. This way, when you issue a transaction, a payment, the transaction will pop up on your Android or iOS phone and you will be able to verify the amount and destination address. Finally, the Ledger Chrome app has an API with which you can easily integrate third-party applications. For instance, if you want to create a multi-signature account with CoinKite or Copay, it will be done using the Ledger Wallet Chrome app. Ledger is making hardware wallets easy and convenient without compromising on security. If you want to get a secure setup for storing your Bitcoins, go to ledgerwallet.com and use the code EPICENTER to get 10% off your order. We'd like to thank Ledger for their support of EPICENTER Bitcoin. You're now working on on a prediction market, right? But you originally got into uh, into Bitcoin quite a while ago, and you started working on on a project called Fairlay, which is a Bitcoin prediction market. Actually, Fairlay also was the, the very first sponsor of this podcast. Right, this was right, a, right, a long a long time ago. So, can you tell us how, like, how did you originally? Uh, get into the space and what was it about prediction markets and bitcoin that you saw like a strong fit and you wanted to create fairly so uh, those were kind of two separate events so so how i got into into bitcoin into the bitcoin space uh, that's quite a funny story to some degree so uh, i think in well i'm not 100 sure it's about the year but it should be 2011 um there was this in in, in germany there was this um new movement uh, the pirate party they they became quite successful in germany so so and one of the ideas of the pirate party is this idea of uh, liquid democracy so everyone can directly vote on on um on political decisions so i joined the pirate party just, just was exciting uh, so and and so i was therefore as everyone every member else asked to vote on decisions like uh those bailout uh, packages on on Greece. Uh, so and I, I just tried to make made a um, um, made a to, to make a good decision. So I tried to inform myself and try to to understand what what's going on on there. And that was kind of the point where I started to realize or start to think about uh, what is money. Um, and I, I started to realize that. Um, Money, if, if if you use it from day to day, and if you use it on a personal level, is very different, or the 
properties of, of money are very different on, on, the, on this personal microeconomic level compared to if you look at it uh, if you look at money from a global scale so if you suddenly talking about uh, billions trillions uh, uh, created uh, as, as uh, in, in those bailout packages uh, it's money, money has then really different uh, properties and I guess that was the point where I also uh, discovered Bitcoin and realized well money is in the end just a social construct and if people agree uh, to, to use something as money um, then it, 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 it can be used as money and obviously I have a computer science background and Bitcoin is super interesting from from that perspective as well how was your experience running fairly uh, tell us like so was was fairly like a centralized prediction market based on Bitcoin and how, how big was the uh, how big uh, how many trades did you get at its peak Right. So, uh, so after I I got I got into Bitcoin, I, I don't know, started to, to buy a, one of those butterfly miners and then stuff like that. I I just uh, want or I, I just wanted to build something on top of it, and um, and I was yeah quite interested in in um, in prediction markets, and I saw well uh, there there is an opportunity to build a prediction market that that purely runs uh, uh, on Bitcoin. So I started with um, Stefan, co-founder. Uh, we, we started Fairlay, and Fairlay is basically a centralized prediction market, um, and and the only kind of the only blockchain component, or it, that it uses the currency Bitcoin, but it doesn't use um, it doesn't use the blockchain to 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 run the bets or to to the logic is is not on on the blockchain. The logic is in a regular server uh, server client model. And so, how did that project turn out? Did you see a lot of traction? Was a lot of interest? Do you feel like it using Bitcoin was a big benefit to the platform? Um, yeah. So so right now, so I'm not. Um, I'm not longer um, uh, actively involved in in, in Fale. It's uh, someone someone else took it over. But uh, so quite now, uh, right now, um, the betting volume in terms of um, is roughly a million a million US or Bitcoin's worth a million US dollar um, a month. Um, so I mean, our initial goal with Fale was. Um, I, I was always fascinated in the idea of you could use a prediction market to aggregate information. So you don't you want to do a forecast on something, uh, then the best tool to aggregate all the and so on. In the end, it turned out sport betting was was made way more successful uh, than than all the uh, markets I found personally interesting. Will Bitcoin <laughs> do a uh, will Bitcoin do a so, uh, increase the block size limit? Will they implement implement segregated witness before? Blah blah blah. And we 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 tried all those markets, and they had not not too big success. But in the end, sports betting went quite well. So so that that's kind of the story of of Valley. Wow. And and then once once you cease to be involved on a day to day basis with Fairly, you came up with the idea of Gnosis and. The big difference between Gnosis and Fail is, of course, that one is based on Ethereum and the other is on Bitcoin. So, w w tell us the fundamental reason uh, you are interested in building a prediction market on Ethereum. What's what's different from Bitcoin? Yeah, I, I would say um, there are um, maybe two two big points. So, so first. Um, with with Ethereum, or, I mean, we we had this goal with with Fairlay as well. So so we thought about how can we do it decentralized. Basically, how can we uh, set it up set it up in, in a way that during predictions uh, we do not need to hold the money because in the end that's just liability. So um, it's just. Uh, um, Additional costs. It's uh, it's it's. It took us. We, we spent so much time to to make it secure, uh, or to, to try to to um, to uh, um, yeah secure the bitcoins. In the end, you you can only lose. So 
So if, if it works well, then okay, uh, every, that, that's nothing unexpected. But if you do a mistake, then it's big big downside. So so obviously uh, it would be great to to have um, to use a decentralized system where you are not um, um, yeah responsible for securing a server or securing a cold wallet. Um, so, so that, that that is one one uh, big point, and uh, um, so it, it, it's to some degree cost efficiency argument. It's uh, it's also a, a argument that that it's easier or might be easier to gain the trust of um, of um, of the people. Uh, but but to me, um, that that is not that's maybe not the really important point. The really important point is. Um, is this decentralized platform aspect? So, uh, if 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 I um, uh, if I look at the Bitcoin uh, sports betting space, there are I, I would say five six bigger uh, sport betting sites that have maybe even or I think a few might might have higher volumes than than Fairlay, but 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 so so who have a decent volume. Uh, from a from an economic or from efficiency perspective, it would be so much more efficient to have them all on one platform. So to have all the liquidity uh, combined on one pl platform. So I, I mean, I mentioned the other problem uh, for for those markets um, for those markets uh, 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 will Bitcoin do this and that. Where, where we could not reach the, the necessary liquidity to have serious uh, uh, markets. So liquidity is a big issue. So you want to have all the liquidity, you want to have all the markets um, in one platform. Um, that's just way more uh, efficient. But how do you agree on one platform? So, I mean, obviously we want to have LA, but obviously others, they, they want to have um, their platform. Um, so there are two, two ways in my opinion so the one way would be to raise a lot of capital um and just to make this big land grab uh and and, and get 80 percent uh on on your platform by just outspending uh, the competition um but there might be a new model and and this would be uh, set up a decentralized um uh platform where where you have some ownership, maybe, and we can discuss this later, but it's 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 still you can guarantee um, good good conditions, um, or you you can give certain guarantees about those who decide uh, to join the platform. Maybe just just, just to to um, make this more clear. So so the other example is, or the, the, if you look outside the crypto space, uh, another platform is is Uber, for example. And, and there's Lyft, obviously, uh, as a competitor. And there is, in principle, no good reason to have um, two competing platforms. You don't want to have liquidity liquidity of drivers split up in, in Uber and Lyft as a user. You, you, you want to have all in one place. You don't want to have uh, eBay or Airbnb. You, you don't want to look at, at five different platforms to, to find out what you need. You want to have all the liquidity, all the uh, flats, all, all the drivers, all the whatever in, in, in one platform. That is way more efficient. However, you don't want to necessarily have um, this one company that, that 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 controls everything because then you have the disadvantages that come with a mono monopoly and and um, too much um, yeah concentrated power so that they can make unreasonable fees or they can they can exclude someone from the platform. Uh, who, who should not be excluded and, and, and stuff like that. So here, um, that, that, that is the big uh, thing I, I, or big application um, I see for, for blockchain and Ethereum in the next years to build those platforms where everyone can agree on because they do, are not controlled by a single entity. Oh, I think, I think, I think that's, that is a very powerful statement and... Uh... Yeah, I'm even trying to think through the implications of of a statement like that. They seem like very multidimensional, but yeah, it does seem to be the case that with a lot of blockchain applications, not just on Ethereum, but even with people trying to build uh, 
permission networks. It seems to be that uh, you want as many people to join one platform as possible because that is when the true utility of the blockchain shines through right. as being as being one one IT system on which all of us could coordinate. Right. And uh, and yeah, maybe maybe the maybe the future does enable a model in which uh, we can not only bring liquidity in prediction markets on one platform or, or cars on one platform, but all sorts of other things, right? Uh, I, I mean, my, my statement is Uber, Airbnb, eBay, and so on, they will all be replaced within the next uh, 10 to 20 years by, by blockchain platforms. Today's magic word is prognosis. That's P-R-O-G-N-O-S-I-S. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word and claim your part of the listener reward. In theory, it's possible to see, it's possible to kind of argue about it. And I, 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 I'm not aware of any good counter arguments to this yet. Uh, but it does, it does also seem to be the case that the engineering side of, of this technology is quite immature for, for something like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there is, uh, there, the internet is a good comparison. So in, in I think we are now in 91 uh, of, of, of the internet. Um, and of course, some people could argue in '91. Well, this is too slow. This will never replace. Uh, uh, you you can never watch movies over the internet, or, and and so on. And well, <laughs> I guess you can. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's such an exciting an exciting vision. And I totally agree. I think this idea that you can have a, a sort of a shared platform that then different people build their businesses on is is, is extremely exciting. Um, Going a little bit more in depth with Gnosis. So we had the, the centralized prediction market using Bitcoin, right? And then we have Gnosis, which, which becomes decentralized. So can you talk th through to us, what does that architecture look like? And how is that different from a, a centralized prediction market? Right. I, I guess, again, there are those two components. There is one, the component that, um, that we can guarantee towards the user. Um, that specific things work like they uh, like they are written in code and not like um, uh, like like we want them. So I mean, in a centralized prediction market, you, you send your bitcoins to someone, they they store the bitcoins, um, and in principle, I mean, in principle, they could or technically it would be possible that they that they just run away with it. Um, in a decentralized uh, prediction market, um, uh, during the um, during the uh, uh, prediction, the ether or Bitcoin tokens, uh, I guess uh, sooner or later there will be Bitcoin tokens on Ethereum and dollar tokens and so on. Um, the money, the collateral, will be um, will be held in a smart contract, and um, and that contract defines exactly uh, who will get the payout under what what conditions, and usually you have uh, an oracle, or you have an oracle that will um, set this condition. So if you do this canonical example, uh, who's an ex-president, will Hillary Clinton be president? Yes, no. You create, um, you put in one, one ether, you get two shares, um, one yes share, one no share. Yes share will, will um, become one ether if she becomes president, no share in the other case, and you will have an oracle that will just provide this data point, uh, is Hillary Clinton president, yes or no? And everything else will be um, will be triggered uh, by, by the contracts and in a predictable and fair way. So the way we perhaps we could imagine it is um, in a particular market, like, like you took the example of the predict presidential election market, you might imagine uh, let's say, I don't know, 1,000 people that are willing to bet on it. And there is either one or a set of smart contracts, which is like a jackpot in the middle. And uh, and basically, like, like these people are kind of depositing money into that jackpot and getting shares in exchange for it. And uh, once the bet resolves, uh, people who are right get the, get the full, full money inside, inside the jackpot, right? Yeah, or they're they're part of uh, how 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 many shares they have of, of this 
jackpot. So, so, so basically, like, out of these 1,000 people, like 500 people might be owning shares for Hillary Clinton. Right. And then uh, when, they, when they bought the share, so they might have sent, let's say, 50 cents to the jackpot and, bought, and purchased the share when the result was not out. Or the price might also have evolved over time. But then once the jackpot, once the event is out, that set of smart contracts takes, takes input from an oracle like um, Oracle Eyes. And then uh, it, it gives uh, away all of the winnings to the people who uh, correctly predicted that particular event. Right. right. Or, yeah, all, all the people who hold shares of the winning outcome. Right. So shares will turn into, into money. And do you have any particular views on what kind of oracles you will uh, you will use for uh, for gnosis at, at the beginning? Right. So, uh, so what we what we are doing, um, we will create or we already create an oracle market. So, um, different oracle providers will will sign up and um, and offer their service, and we already have agreements with. Um, with reality keys, uh, we spoke with Oracle Eyes. There's a, uh, smart contracts. Um, they they also provide the Oracle service. But also we are talking to uh, Wolfram Alpha. They are interested in providing their data um, for Ethereum uh, and also companies like Bloomberg. So I uh, totally expect that in a few years um, or in maybe less. Uh, Bloomberg will provide their uh, data feed uh, with a signature, and that's all you need. So you not necessarily need, um, you don't need those oracles to know about this prediction market. So so they, they do not have to interact directly with the prediction market. Uh, they even do not have to interact with, with Ethereum itself. All they need to do is uh, somewhere publish um, the outcomes with a signature um, that that everyone knows that belongs to them, and as soon as they do that, uh, then um, basically the signed the signed piece of data that says the price of the U.S. dollar compared to euro or whatever was this and this at at that point in time, and there's a signature of uh, of, of Bloomberg uh, beyond it then you can take this piece of data and uh, put it into the Ethereum blockchain. Anyone can do it. And the contract can evaluate it step by step and say, yes, this is the right signature. Um, and those are the data points. And then it can um, execute whatever uh, whatever is, is built around, uh, around it. I totally agree. I, I thought about this quite a lot and mentioned it to various people and had this discussion. I think Bloomberg is in such an interesting position there uh, to provide exactly this kind of service. Now, I, I'm curious here, how would the company monetize that? Because if you have that kind of dissociation from like publishing the data, signing it and, and the actual markets, like there doesn't seem to be a clear way to directly monetize it. Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, and I don't have um, I don't have the perfect answer yet. I mean, the obvious one is is to to charge per per um, per data point, um, but but it would not allow um, this model would not allow to charge a fraction of uh, of of the market. So it would only um, it, it would not poss uh, be possible to distinguish between um, between a data point that settles something worth ten dollars or a data point that settles some something worth a uh, hundred million dollars, so that might be a challenge for for a business model. Personally, I think uh, I, I suspect uh, I suspect the the uh, the fundamental feature that can drive uh, monetization in this market is uh, reliability. So. Uh, so let's say let's say I, I I build a prediction market, and that prediction market needs the input of uh, some event in the future. Now, uh, I ideally want there to be a strong guarantee that the data is going to come from a certain source. Right. And uh, if if I just choose to choose to take uh, 
data from Bloomberg without paying them anything, then they have no uh, need to guarantee reliability to me. And it's, it's this need for my reliability that there's certainty that I get the data from Bloomberg and it will happen that might drive me as the market creator to pay a bit of, uh, of, of, of whatever profit I make to Bloomberg. Now, so that's one thing. And the second thing is, um, even in this Oracle market, I've actually talked to a few employees at Bloomberg, whether they'd be interested to do something like this. And it turns out that Bloomberg is, uh, is a company that is completely focused on selling these Bloomberg terminals. So these are, um, for people who are not aware, for, for traders, uh, you can buy a terminal, which is a piece of hardware. And then on this piece of hardware, you can receive all sorts of financial information. And uh, Bloomberg doesn't offer currently any, any choice if you want to just receive a subset of information. So, for example, you buy a Bloomberg terminal, you put like $2,000 per month into it, and then you receive all of the information o over all of the markets. But if I just want to receive, say, data about London Brent crude market, then there's no way today I can get just Bloomberg data or London Brent crude. I would have to spend the Bloomberg terminal. And they have kind of stuck to this business model for over, over 10 years, even though many different markets have demanded different solutions. And so it, it seems interesting that in this market, Wolfram Alpha actually seems a, a much more interesting player, which which is more suited to, to, this in, to this kind of application where we need data about very specific things only at very specific times. This seems to be something that uh, they are already doing rather than Bloomberg, which is in a completely different field. It's good to have competition. <laughs> there will be competition. And so um, we'll see. Do you, think, do you think reliability drives monetization here? Um, yes. Um, so reliability is... Of course, uh, extremely important. However, um, we also have thought about things um, to to um, to kind of make a system work, even if the uh, if, even if the oracle is is not one hundred percent reliable. So the um, the default setup we want to use in Gnosis um, is that you use a centralized Oracle like uh, Bloomberg or like um, uh, Wolfram Alpha or in the first days, uh, reality keys. Um, but there will be a short uh, a kind of challenge period. So, so the, the Oracle will, will publish this data, uh, data point, um, and then there will be a short challenge period. And if everyone agrees with this outcome, uh, it is fine. Um, and it will just be executed, money will be paid out, and then it's kind of irreversible. Um, but if during this challenge period someone puts up um, some uh, security deposit, they can trigger a decentralized oracle. Um, and they could, if, if this challenge is successful, um, they could um, revert um, the outcome. So even, even, if, even if the if the Oracle is not 100% safe or trusted, um, then you uh, uh, could still use it in the model. However, you still have a point if the, if the, um, if the uh, um, Oracle is more trusted, then you could have this challenge period shorter and that would uh, free, free capital earlier. So you have a little bit less uh, capital costs. So of course, uh, reliable Oracle um, and uh, yeah, basically your reputation as an oracle will be something you can monetize. Let's take a short break to talk about JAX. JAX is a cryptocurrency wallet created by the people at the central. Now there are two cryptocurrencies that matter at the moment. One is Bitcoin and one is Ether. But using them can be tricky. What wallet to use? How do you secure them? Where did I leave my umbrella? It's all a big mess. And that's where JAX comes in. JAX is a unified wallet. It works across all your devices. It works for the Android phone, Apple iPhone. It works for your desktop computer. And they have browser extensions for Chrome and Firefox. And it works for both currencies at the same time. It works for Bitcoin and it works for Ether. One of the things that makes JAX as delightful as walking through the fifth arrondissement of Paris on a Sunday morning and getting a whiff of fresh pastries 
is uh, how they leverage HD wallets. So they use a 12 word single backup seed for all three currencies and make it super easy to sync your wallets across all your devices. So if you're using the Chrome extension or the desktop app, you just can whip out your phone, scan the QR code, and boom, your wallets are synced. And plus, uh, the people at Jax take your security very seriously. It's open source, so anybody can look at the code. And plus, they never hold any customer funds. All the keys are stored locally uh, on the client side. So go to Jax.io, that's J-A-X-X.io, download the Jax wallet right now and understand what it's like to use a next generation wallet. We'd like to thank Jax for their support of Epicenter. Martin, there's also been uh, plans about a Gnosis DAO, a Gnosis Fund, and a crowd sale. Can you tell us about those? Yeah, of course. So, um, so to build this, um, to build this uh, decentralized prediction market uh, platform, our um, yeah, our path forward will be uh, to also do uh, a crowd sale. And of course, part of the reason is um, to raise to raise money um, to do this, but also uh, it, it, it's also about um, creating the, the right incentives to have this one platform that aggregates uh, all the liquidity. To build such a platform, you want to have as much uh, stakeholders and shareholders um, as possible. You want to align the incentives of everyone um, uh, who, who, who is in the space uh, to agree, let's coordinate on this platform and let's uh, achieve by this the, max the maximum possible um, uh, efficiency. Um, so yeah, that's why we will, um, that's why we will announce or are announcing now that we are uh, preparing a crowd sale, so we will. Uh, we aim currently for um, the weeks around DefCon, um, the next uh, DefCon two in Shanghai, the big big Ethereum um, uh, conference, and we we want to uh, fund two two entities. So first, um, the Gnosis DAO um, that will that will um, build the platform um, that will run the platform, that will to some degree govern the platform. Um, and the second entity will be the Gnosis Fund um, that, um, that will fund projects and uh, we call it skins um, that, that can or will be built on top of the platform. So you can build uh, kind of endless things you could you could do with a prediction market. So you can you can do uh, insurance, you can do uh, sports betting, you can do forecasting of um, of the weather, you can do uh, forecasting the next Supreme Court decisions. So so there are endless possibilities you can do uh, with with a prediction market, and and each of them. Although they are um, they are fundamentally using the same the same mechanisms, they will have very different user bases. They will need very different um, um, interfaces. It's super important to, to 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 create interfaces that people understand and, and are are easy usable. Um, and they maybe even need to um, or they they need to be in different jurisdictions uh, to to. Um, to comply with, with different uh, laws and regulations. Um, so those, um, so that, that is our second entity. Um, we want to crowdfund uh, this Gnosis fund that will uh, invest in those uh, ventures. So let's say, let's say I'm a, I'm a, I participate in the crowd sale and I send some ether and get some tokens in the Gnosis DAO. Right? Now, uh, does in the Gnosis now do I expect a dividend of some sort in the future? Is it the case that uh, the DAO will make profits of some sort and give me a dividend, or is it like Bitcoin, which is which has no dividends? So it it, it will have some uh, some utility. So the tokens you you will get um, in in the Gnosis DAO uh, will have three uh, three properties. So they will first be used. To um, to govern 
the platform. Um, they will be second. Secondly, they they will give you the right um, to create uh, markets um, on top uh, of of the platform, and they will give you the right to create markets um, without paying a fee on those markets. And that's that, that's super important. I will I will go in, into this a uh, little bit deeper. But yes, they will also um, give you uh, um, will give you a fraction of the shares uh, of, of the fees that that are earned um, uh, on the platform. So so may, maybe let let me uh, describe a little bit um, this fee model and and why we think that that is um, that, that that is super important and it plays back to this this idea. How can you create a platform where everyone um, uh, can can agree on? Um, and, and as much as people could, could agree on such a platform. So you could have um, a model where, um, where you would charge specific fee, 1%, half a percent, whatever, um, and distribute it to, to the token holders. Mm, however, uh, if you are in today a new, if, let's say you, you, you raise, Two million to, to, to build a sport betting thing. Um, the question is, would you really build on top of a platform where you would forever uh, need to pay, um, e even if it's a low percentage of, of, of fees? So it's it's to some degree questionable, and and often uh, whether whether you would build on a platform where you you uh, would have to pay pay fees um, uh, for forever. So and and, and then. Creates an incentive to split no, and to fork. Right, right, right. So, so often the question that comes is, uh, why cannot someone just copy, uh, copy the the platform and remove the fee from it, and and, and then um, run run without the fee, and and, and that is why we want to um, offer an option to um, to to buy in into the platform. Um, um, as a long-term stakeholder and shareholder, and then use it without uh, paying a fee. And in our claim, uh, to, to make it simple, is uh, the oversimplification is the claim: uh, we want to build a platform that creates value and does not extract value. So what what do you mean? What do we mean by this? So the idea is: you you have your money, you want to you want to build something, and and you might decide: well, instead of Forking it and and having the costs of, of, of forking it and then maintaining my own fork and having the um, disadvantage of, of uh, not sharing the liquidity pool, not sharing uh, the same platform. I just buy into the platform, so I buy so and so much tokens of the platform, and that gives me the right to create, let's say, a hundred markets a day, and don't have and I don't have to pay a fee on those um, hundred markets. So what does this mean? So that means that there will be, as long as people will uh, want to want to use this platform, there will be demand for those tokens um, because you need to hold those tokens and you need to hold them for for maybe you, you need to even lock them down to to um, to uh, to create those markets for free. So the tokens by only by this by this demand will will have a value. Uh, even if no fees, even if no one would uh, do the other model, so the, so the other model is if, if you don't uh, want to invest uh, capital and you don't want to uh, make an upfront uh, investment, you still can create markets and then pay your uh, 1% or 2% fee on those markets. But even if everyone would uh, use the tokens and no revenue would be generated whatsoever, the tokens would still have a value because you just need them, you just need to hold them. Um, there is this buy demand for for them. Um, so if more and more people want to use the platform, the tokens will also gain in value, and that, that's our claim. We want to create value uh, instead of um, yeah extracting value. Yeah, I mean, so what you're saying is uh, you can imagine this as like a a country club or gentlemen's club or whatever, right? Like so, there's a there's like a club of people, a group of people that can create markets and do trades for free but in order to enter that uh, enter that group you need to have tokens 
above a certain amount i i assume right, right. okay and so so this is the argument that um the utility of the gnosis token is it's like an entry ticket like it is it is actually reminds me of the utility of ether itself that uh you hold ether because you want to pay uh, pay gas fees it's like an entry fee in order to do things uh, in on the ethereum platform and very similarly uh, gnosis tokens will be an entry fee to for this club in order that you can trade on it for free yeah although if we would uh, if we would stick to the ether example then it would be like let's say you would need to hold those uh, ether and you would need to lock them down uh, and that would give you the right let, let's say it would be like uh, if you hold one ether um for one day that gives you the right the right to to do one transaction uh, for free so so that would be kind of the anal analogy so so then there would be still demand for for ether and it would be still uh, uh, have have value although it would not be spent or it, it, there, there would there would be no transaction fees and I, I guess that that would be also for ether an interesting model okay so do you have any interesting governance proposals for the dao itself <laughs> right so so uh, obviously as a prediction market um we uh we are super excited of of the model to use the prediction market itself um as the governance model and i mean i guess that that has been this concept of fufu turkey or I never know exactly how to pronounce it. Um, this has been well discuss discussed for for quite a while, and I guess we want to be the, the first entity that actually um, uh, uses this, uses it, uh, is is using it. So so um, so the model we 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 believe that this model of um, Turkey. Um, Will not and cannot be used for um, for small day-to-day -day decisions, and I would argue even voting is is is, is not is, uh, is 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 not um, suitable for. So it, it's in my opinion not a suitable model to have ten thousand token holders and 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 to let them vote on on every small decision. And with Futaki, it's even more problematic because you can only, in my opinion. Uh, make good decisions with Futaki uh, if there are long-term, uh, bigger long-term implications of a decision. Um, so the way we will um, set our DAO up is that we have a core team and this core team can make um, by default proposals. And by default, those proposals uh, will, be, will be accepted. Um, However, it's always possible uh, to challenge or to, to kind of veto um, such a proposal and start this, um, this uh, Futaki mechanism. And this Futaki mechanism would work. Uh, let's say there's a proposal, a bigger proposal to spend so and so much over the next years or over the next month on, on, on those projects. And someone disagrees with that, um, then this Futaki mechanism would, would basically create two versions of, um, of Gnosis tokens. It would create uh, Gnosis tokens under the condition, um, and, and that's, kind of a, that's kind of how a prediction market works. It would create two tokens, one under the condition that um, the decision is implemented and one that it is not implemented. And then there will be a trading period for a week or two, um, and then and then automatically that decision will be made uh, that would maximize or increase the value of NOS tokens. So if NOS tokens are more, have a higher value under the condition that it will be implemented, then it will be implemented. Otherwise, it will not be implemented. And eventually, um, this, this mechanism uh, can also be used to exchange the core team. So uh, we we will um, suggest uh, that that we will 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 be the for, first um, or that we will be the core team that that can by default uh, make um, decisions and make um, um, those proposals. However, with this Futaki mechanism, it will be possible um, to 
challenge or to, to exchange um, the core team with the same mechanism. So if NOSIS tokens would have a higher value under the condition that there would be a different core team, mm -hmm. then that can be done. Yeah, that's that's very exciting. And uh, I look forward to, to actually seeing the, the future key uh, mechanisms in action and see how they, they play out. I'm sure it's going to take quite a lot of time and playing around and figuring out, especially user interface and user experience to get this right. But I think once, once, uh, once we get it right, it will be super powerful. Um, so you, you mentioned a core team, and that kind of brings up an, uh, an important issue here, right? So as, as you're now doing a token sale, what's going to be the relationship and the kind of business model for, for you guys, uh, the founders and the company, uh, and, and how does that relate to the token holders? Right. So um, also there, we, we, we came up um, with, the, with the innovation. Um, so our idea is that those who buy the tokens um, can voluntarily decide um, in the moment they, they buy a token. So, so they will spend one Ether, get 100 tokens, and then they have the option, they can decide on their own to create another, to uh, another more tokens up to 100, um, so, so ranging from zero to 100, that would um, be issued in addition and would be sent um, to the core team. And the idea or the reasoning behind it is um, that maybe tokens are uh, more valuable if there is um, is a core team or, um, I mean, it, it, it's, it's like a startup. So, so uh, you can, if you want to, if you want to invest in a startup, uh, of course, you, you on the one hand, you want to have as much equity as possible, um, but it's also it's also um, a good idea. Or, or some some people say they would only um, put money into something where there is a core team that has at least ten or thirty or forty or fifty percent um, in own okay. interest. Okay, that that is that is super fascinating. So essentially, what you're saying is people put in money, right? I, I get my hundred tokens, and I say, okay, I'm gonna give ten additional or thirty additional, etc., to the team. So essentially, it's sort of a choose your own dilution model. Uh, but also, of course, what this brings up is that you have a big free rider problem, right? So economically, probably the rational thing to do for me would be to not give any tokens to the so it's, it's not it's it's not the free rider problem because you will get if you put in one ether you will get hundred tokens anyway, anyways. So you don't have to use your own tokens uh, to give a fraction of your own tokens um, yeah. uh, to the core team. You would just generate another uh, X token. So if you decide that ratio is fair, then to some degree everyone would uh, would. Um, would, would yeah. the solution. Yeah, yeah, you, you're totally right. Yeah, no, I got that wrong. No, that's that that's very true, and that that's a extremely interesting model. Does that mean those additional tokens would go to the to founding team, sort of as like equity in the thing, and then they would get paid from the ether, you know, their salaries and things like that? I, I guess it's important to note that that those. That, that we we try to go or we will go this route that we see those tokens as as something as a software that is uh, necessary to use uh, the platform or you with so um, but but yes it, it will go um, it will go to the core team so the idea is that and and we will have um, kind of long term uh, vesting so on, only people who at least spend three years uh, working on it will in the core team will eventually get um, those tokens, uh, but yes, in addition, uh, the money, the ether that is collected, will be will be used to pay uh, regular salaries. Now, uh, a last topic that we should probably address because many people will have that question: there is a prediction market or a, a project for a prediction market at least uh, on Ethereum already that has gotten quite a lot of attention because they did a successful crowd. Uh, funding campaign as well, which is Augur. Can you just very briefly address, like, what's the difference between Gnosis and Augur? Sure, sure. So um, I would say they are 
maybe three three differences. Uh, first, of course, they they similar thing. It's also working on on um, on Ethereum, and they also have the goal to build a decentralized prediction market. Um, however, so our um, our Oracle model is very different. So so they they have this um, this model where every um, every Augur token holder would vote on every uh, on every outcome, and we think um, that is simply not efficient. So so for for a FLA, for example, uh, uh, currently there are two thousand uh, events created per day, uh, and the claim of Augur is uh, every month uh, every token holder would vote on on um, on the outcome of events. You can simply calculate 30 so so in, in 30 days um, only fairly and, and fairly is not uh, is not um, that big yet uh, it, it would be 60,000 events where you would vote on so, uh, so, so that, that that would not work uh, in, in in my opinion or in our opinion or at least it would be very inefficient um, so again our model is to use um, this, uh, as a default, use centralized oracles um, like again Bloomberg, Wolfram Alpha, um, and only have as a backup mechanism um, the decentralized and uh, a decentralized oracle. So that that is point uh, point number one. Uh, point number two is that we uh, focus we focus on uh, being uh, a platform. Where it should be super easy to uh, to build your um, uh, applications uh, on on top. So again, uh, there's so much you can do with the prediction market, some insurance, flight insurance markets, some bug bounty markets for finding uh, uh, finding bugs in a contract, some um, credit uh, peer to peer lending, credit default swap market, and and so on and so on. And uh, we want to um, provide a tool set to make it very easy uh, for for developers, uh, and eventually even make it so easy that you don't even need a developer uh, to build um, such such markets. So our claim is eventually it should be as easy as today setting up a WordPress block. So if you're interested in a topic, you, with a few clicks you can set up your WordPress block on a specific topic. And similar to that, it should be as easy to set up your uh, prediction market on a specific um, topic with Gnosis. Uh, okay, that, that was point two. And point three is, I guess, this um, this other platform model where it hopefully will uh, be easier to coordinate on to to agree um, that those rules uh, that, that, that you would like to make a midterm or long-term commitment to those rules because you know if I am a share a token holder to that degree, then I cre can uh, create unlimited markets without losing value to the platform and still giving the platform value. That, that's a beautiful part of it, in my opinion. Okay, Martin, um, thanks so much for coming on. That was extremely interesting talking about uh, Gnosis prediction markets fairly and, and the exciting future that's ahead of us. Now, of course, we will link to uh, the website and we look forward very much to the to news and the developments that will come up with the, the crowdfunding campaign. And I'm sure a lot of people that might not be as familiar with Gnosis at the moment will become a lot more acquainted as the project kind of comes out and, and, and does a, a crowdfunding campaign that hopefully has a happier ending than the last DAO. <laughs> so thanks so much for coming on, Martin. All right, thank you, thank you. And with that, that's it. So thanks so much for listening. We will be back next week. So Epicenter Bitcoin is part of the LTB network. You can find this show and lots of others on letstalkbitcoin.com. Uh, we put out new episodes every Monday. You can get it, of course, with all your favorite podcast apps or watch the videos on youtube.com slash epicenterbitcoin. And, and that's it. So we look forward to seeing you back next week.